All right, this is No Excuses with Michael DeLeonardo. I'm your host, RJ Roger. Michael, how are you, brother? Very good. Very good. Thank you for asking. I hope everybody out there is well also. So, guys, this was a completely unplanned thing. Um, we usually give people a few-day notice before we, before we go live, but um, Michael and I were talking, and it dawned on both of us, well, him, and then he let me know. Um, RJ, <laughs> that's how you say my name, Michael. <laughs> um, today's 12-12, and it and didn't even hit me at first. Um, and I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, we've been discussing for the last four weeks, and I put it all together. So on our Patreon show, for the past uh, four weeks, we have been combing through the Gotti tapes. Um, the transcripts line by line on Patreon. We have, you know, the first four episodes are available. And um, the most critical of all the tapes were the December 12th tapes, hence today, 1212. Um, so I'll really quickly give my opinion on this. I have read the Gotti, uh, uh, the, the Ravenite tapes, uh, the, the transcripts through and through probably a half dozen times in my life. I had my opinion on them. Um, Michael, as an insider, a guy who was there, has, um, has broken these tapes down in a way that has been so revealing to me. It has completely changed my perspective um, on the entire situation that led to everything that we all know that happened. Um, so, and from all the feedback that we get, it looks like a lot of the audience has a similar opinion. So, Michael, let me ask you, today's 1212. Tell me the significance of these tapes uh, of, of this day. Well, this is a day that took John down and uh, put him in jail for the rest of his life. This is a day that he regretted every day he was in his cell. That all the people were gonna get hurt from it, himself never being able to come home, the embarrassment of getting caught on tape like that, the breach of protocol of talking about all the substantive stuff he did, incriminating stuff that inculpated himself and many others in the uh, crime families, um, especially the Gambino family. And um, I know John, every day regretted this day. He was hot, he was angry, he was disappointed with Gravano, with a lot of things that were going on, but there's no excuse for him to talk in a place consistently like that. And John became aware of that after he found out he was on tape. I'll tell you, Something I think I said in the past, early on, John had told me one day in passing, he says, Michael, if I ever get caught on tape, talk, like Paul Castellano got talking in his house, getting comfortable there, I'll throw myself off a fucking bridge. He got caught on tape again. It wasn't the first time John got caught on tape. But this one was a devastating blow to him and everybody else, like I just articulated. At the end, Another comment he makes to me, he comes over, he gives me that pat on the chest and he goes, Michael, I become a creature, very solemn. I become a creature of habit. Don't become a creature of habit. At this point, he knew he was getting arrested. He probably found out that that apartment was bugged. So this day creates a lot of things for him. What I just said about John realizing all the mistakes he made, but he creates Gravano, the devastation that he had done to our family and other families through Gravano's interpretations and his feelings on what John was saying about him. The ramifications of this day is what changes history for the Gaudis, for the Gambino family, and uh, history in itself of what, what transpired in that apartment through his mouth. 
John got too comfortable. John forgot his own advice. You're not supposed to talk about murders. You're not supposed to talk about the things he said. What I'm doing here is I don't have a side to pick, John or Sammy. I'm just telling you what happened, what transpired, what was going through his mind at that time that I feel. And um, his opinion of Gravano, how it changed over the course of from 1986 to this point, 1989. A lot of things transpired. Not only John fell asleep in that apartment talking in it through his anger, but through his sleeping with Gravano. He knows he let him go too far. He knows his position was at risk. Within a year, no, well, a year later, uh, they, they all get arrested. Four guys. Who knows if this day with these tapes, how bad, however bad it turned out, may have saved one of their lives and more lives after that, because I really feel one was going to kill the other sooner or later after hearing these tapes. Let me just say, I'm not no Shradamus and I don't have a crystal ball. I did not know, like many other people, that this was going on, this riff between John and Sammy. Nobody knew about these tapes or what was on them. Only the people, the participants in that room. So this is a day that changed the world for the Gambino family at that time. So let me uh, follow up a little bit here. The biggest thing that you've brought attention to I feel like you opened up a new piece of history, truthfully. Most of what we have heard about these tapes have largely come from the only person who's left to talk about it. John's not here. John's voice is the tapes. That's all we got to, to know John's psychology of that moment and what was going on in the family. And we don't have to rehash the whole tapes right now because we already went through them. But if you can just touch on it a little bit, in a nutshell, what is it that you would say is the biggest misunderstanding that's out there about the dynamics between Sammy and John? Well, you had two people who will have leadership qualities. Two people that were very strong, had very strong crews. Two people without Frankie De Chico in the middle, to be the oil between them, turned out to be a disaster because these are two big egos. And if you think Sammy didn't have an ego, she didn't know Sammy. <laughs> Sammy was a powerhouse. Sammy knew he could take that family over. What would happen after that's another story with other families. But that's something we'll touch on in the future. Uh, but Sammy had the ability to usurp John. And that wasn't just through a vote. It would have to be to kill him. And I think, listen to these tapes. I know, I don't have to think about it. I know through these tapes, someone was going to die sooner or later. It's only a matter of time. I'll get into John's reasons why he did it, why I think, why he didn't kill Sammy. He let it go for another year. Um, Sammy, I think at time, if he would have realized that John was that angry and it would have got out sooner or later, or John taking him for that walk, those million time walks that John said on tape, sooner or later, Sammy would have known he was up against the wall and feeling he was going to be punished for something that he thought he was doing good for the family, which, listen to the tapes, Sammy made a lot of mistakes doing what he did that caused John to be that angry. Yeah, that's what I would say is what you opened my eyes up to see is that John, it would appear to me more that what you helped me to see was that John was, John trusted Sammy. He, he, trust, he trusted that you're working in the interest of the administration. Um, and then when he realized later on 
huh, maybe that's not what's going on here. Yeah, yeah, I'm I mean, sure. So the anger, would you would you say that the anger in that apartment was that realization? Oh yeah, it, it all it all started to hit him at this point. And we have a couple of more tapes. I don't want to go too far. We have a couple of more mm -hmm. tapes from this day. I want everybody to understand what we already done with these tapes is still the same night. <laughs> this is not another day. And we still got hours more to talk about from the same night. Most of these extra excerpts we give you, the first one was 10 minutes long and change. The other one was 19 minutes long. The one we're working on is 18 minutes long. But we took a talk for two hours about breaking them down. Because behind every thing that comes out of John's mouth means something in the way he puts it, in his street jargon, street vernacular, his street talk, the way he's talking to Frankie Lowe. And Frankie Lowe is, gets it, don't, don't get it, is nervous about what to say, says the wrong thing, then says the right thing. John's very frustrated with Frankie Lowe also. He's trying to figure out where Frankie Lowe is. Frankie Lowe is a good guy. But John's not thinking that he's a good guy right now because he's not taking a strong acting underboss position with John in concert. And John's getting furious with the both of them right now. So I'll give my reasons why John, I think, lets it go down the road. Uh, but we still got more to talk about, and I think there's the next couple of tapes are going to be more interesting as to see really what John's. It's it sounds like it's about money, it sounds like it's about it is about money, but it's not about money. Be patient what I say. John's not a money guy, he wasn't about money. He entrusted Sammy to bring you. Br I tell you what to do, I gave you industry, you just bring it. I don't want to see books. I don't want to see records. I don't want to hear where I came from. And he's right. You're putting your life up by handling that. Like when I got that message from MCC, congratulations, you got the construction, you and Eddie. Fuck up, we're killing you. <laughs> right? So Sammy had the same. He didn't have to get that message. Him and John had a very close relationship with the Paul. So this is John's anger that he was manipulating the family, he thought. And it was obvious that you could see by him calling people, Sammy, uh, and what he, how he was acting. Maybe not Sammy's mind. Maybe Sammy felt like all the companies he started, he'd have to give John nothing. Looks like he didn't. John says it. Got nothing. I'm getting nothing from them. I'm not creating. He's creating. But he ain't creating for the family. He's creating for him. Remember, there's creating, then there's creating. Mm -hmm. right? so, <laughs> and you got to watch all those little things that John says. For the people that didn't see our, our episodes, those little things that John says means a lot. And Frankie Lowe, I don't think, caught them at times. Uh, and that's where my opinion, my interpretation comes out, what's in John's mind at that time. Which as, as, as him being the boss, he's right. The guy is right. He's wrong to talk in the apartment. That's how he started this. He ruined himself. And he knew it at the end. One of the clips we put out on YouTube that got a lot of feedback, people, you know, and one of the most explosive statements, I think that, or... Uh, revealing statements, I think you said, this is the misnomer that Sammy's the victim. John's the victim. That's a whole new perspective. That's a whole new way for, for everyone to try to process that. John don't know how to run a business. John don't know anything about books. Sammy knew all that. Sammy was very, very good at that. As we see, give Sammy, you know, you put him in a horse, a, a stable with horse shit, Sammy will come out with a horse. <laughs> you know? So, uh, and I got that from his brother-in-law, Eddie. So I'll, I'll, I'll give Eddie credit. 
he said that to me once. Not about Sammy, just in general. But that was Sammy. He, he could create. And uh, John's trust in him was really lost at this point. Of course, there's murders involved. Let's not discount the murders. John's taking lives on Sammy's word. Now, again, debatable through Sammy. Like you, you, when you open this up, John is on tape convicting himself. He's convicting himself. Why isn't he telling the truth? Yeah, he's got a lot of exaggeration. That's the way John speaks. Yeah, maybe embellished here and there. But the appointments, the sit-downs, to say, go downstairs, ask this, this person. Go downstairs, ask that person. It's, it's there. That's what he's telling Frankie Lowe. You don't believe me, go ask. Which Frankie Lowe would never do that, because that means you're questioning the boss. John's smart enough to know that, too. But he gives him the opportunity to say, look, I'm laying out my case with Gravano. Where are you? And this is the day, like I said, that uh, hurt all of us. Hurt all of us in that family. It changed it, it changed it forever in my tenure. I just didn't say forever, it has changed. It's morphed into something different. Something better. Nobody's dying anymore in that family. Nobody's dealing drugs no more in that family. Great thing. But at that time, it was devastating for all of us around. If I can ask, because um, it's not, again, it's not much color around this because it hasn't been someone as big as you that has that have been out um, that, that was there. So you were there, you heard the family talking, you rose up higher in the family after John went away, after Sammy uh, went, went away, your, your position, for the next 10 years was, you know, you were helping run the family, you were helping Junior, with, you know, helping the panel, you were, you know, leading big rackets. What was the sentiment in the family? Is the sentiment in the fam, as an insider, did most of the family have a similar position than what you're talking about, how you're analyzing these tapes? Did the family see it the, kind of the same way, a lot differently that, or, what was the insider scoop? Well, after all said and done, when Sammy flipped, everybody went like, phew. just like when John went to jail, they went, phew. they had a double phew between the two of them gone. Everybody was complaining about, now uh, that's broad brush. A lot of people complained about Sammy and what he was doing. Sammy don't know that. He may think he knows it, but I was in the street. A lot of people resented Sammy. A lot of people resented his crew. Three guys were going to die in his crew because of it. They wanted to make sure that crew never came back. Killed three of the main people there were close to Gravano. So, yes, there was definitely rumbling. And look, after the fact, Everybody could say, yeah, I know about this about Sammy. I knew that about Sammy. That there's so, Most of those guys are full of shit. They didn't know nothing. They used to go in and kiss Sammy's ass, right? But there were certain guys, influential guys in those industries that Sammy stepped on their toes. Then later on, you know, they, they, they were happy he was gone, whether he flipped or not. But, you know, they were worried about him flipping because he sent a lot of those same guys to prison. Uh, and they were, you know, like I said, with John's, Tough thing to say, but a lot of people want the John off the street. A lot of people that didn't. A lot of people were loyal to John. But they know he made a mistake talking to that apartment. And uh, when people are going to jail, it's hard to like somebody still. When you get when you run your mouth the way he did, when he should have known better. And the damage he caused. Can, when you Earlier in the you started, you and I didn't even understand that at first. You explained it to me, so I'm going to ask it for the viewer. When you say John fell asleep, and I, I'm not going to fall asleep the way Paul fell asleep. John said that in the Raven night. I'm not going to do what Paul did. What, what does that mean, fall asleep? Did your train just show up over there, RJ? I just had a train in the background. Is that a train in the background? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, it's, 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 you're late or something? <laughs> 
<laughs> Pass us through once a day. I open up a coffee shop over there. You and I come on open a coffee <laughs> shop. Uh, guys, what was that question again? So in the tapes, um, John says, you know, I'm not going to be like Paul. I'm not going to fall asleep. Um, what is that? Can you explain to everybody in layman terms what John's saying? But I'm not going to make the same mistake as Paul and fall asleep. I'm not going to fall asleep on Sammy. Paul fell asleep on John. John yeah. said, I'm not going to fall asleep on Sammy. Yeah. Well, what does that mean? Well, John fell asleep on Sammy. Now he's he's regurgitating all the mistakes that he made by letting Sammy go. He gave Sammy full reign. And now he sees it's it's not just the money, but it is the money. John's supposed to be getting the money. It's not that he's embarrassed by Sammy taking things he's not supposed to. It's not that all the captains were coming in beefing to him with every industry. It's the murder still. He realized it, it's a collective compilation of things that he realized, what the, what happened here? He's saying he's not going to fall asleep, but he really means he fell asleep. And it's going to stop now because his eyes are open now. It all hit him. You know, the thing I found that I find most interesting when I look at the transcripts and hearing you break them down, some of the some of the biggest complaints were the same on both sides. Sammy's biggest, Sammy says it on his podcast. He talks about it in um, in his book. Guys were coming to him, you know, captains were coming to him complaining about John for different things. Money was another one, you know. Um, I heard him talk about that before as far as, you know, he I, I think he even said something in his book or, or on a show, one of the two where, you know, John had more of a philosophy like or told him before, Sam, you're giving your guys too much. But if you look at the transcripts, Gotti is saying, he says in, in one section, 25 captains in the family, 22 are coming to me with a beef about Tammy, about all the money's going in one direction. It's, it, he talks about, I'm not going to create an army within the army. I'm not going to, you know, he's talking about, it looks like on John's side, he's worried about the rest of the brigada, the rest of the family, that guys are, all the, everything is going, you know, it's going to two or three people. He says there's two, three people going to wind up with everything. Talks about, that's why I hated Paul, you know. Um, so the complaints seem to be the same. Sammy says, everyone was coming to me complaining. John says, everyone's coming to me complaining. You know, you were there. The only complaint I heard about John, and there were whisper complaints, it was going to, and the guys that were very, very close, was going to the Ravenite, going to the Bergen, with the FBI outside all the time. Those are those are the press outside. Those are the big complaints requiring people to come every week. And guys, like I said, after a while, I, I had to be five days a week at the Raven Night, one day out in Queens. Yeah, it was, it was quite six days a week. That's what he wanted. That's what I did. I didn't complain about it. Was it right? I told Jackie one day, we're walking to, uh, towards the Raven Night. And uh, there's, there's FBI all over. They were sitting in the car in front of the, of, right in front of the club. And uh, I said, Jack. This is lambs to slaughter. And I know I could get away with it with Jack saying that. I couldn't get away with anybody else. So that was probably the biggest complaint, pulling all these old timers and guys. Uh, the FBI didn't, didn't even know a lot of the old timers. A lot of these guys were in the woodwork. And pull them out and put them on film and taking pictures. And if when there's cases, that's all you got to show is this mass group of mob guys hanging around a club. It doesn't look that good. Uh, the, the gripes about Gravano were, were money. Sammy didn't make up. There's a little mistake there also. Sammy didn't make everybody rich. His crews didn't get rich. They got jobs. They handled certain things. There's certain guys that made a lot of money with him. No question. But there's other guys that they didn't get rich. They, all, they earned, earned a living. They were able to open up companies, but they all gave Sammy an end. 
Jack Colucci for one. Sammy shot his father in the head. He had the kid with him. That's another story. He slipped. Uh, but he, 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 Jack was giving Sammy money. Everybody gave Sammy money. Yeah, he let them in the business. Jack was in the concrete business. So, uh, you know, that's what John means. But as far as uh, everybody complaining about John, I never heard anything besides everybody show up. That's it. Even after, we'll talk about during, right? And after. I never heard anything about John negative in any other way besides the tapes getting caught in the apartment and him having everybody show up. There was nothing that I could think of that they knocked John for. I'm going to take a couple questions from, I just saw one that, um, let me get your opinion on this. Um, I feel like, hang on one second here. I feel like it's a flip of a story now. All the blame is on Sammy. Mikey had great times with Sammy. I wish he would tell those stories. Sammy wasn't a complete terrible person. How do you respond to that, Michael? X man, what's going on? <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a lot of great times with Sammy. Absolutely. Went to his farm. We went out drinking. He would come to my club. I'd go to his club. All his guys would come to my club and uh, drink all night long. Sammy used to sit down in the card game just to break chops and deal cards. He was bored. After they clipped the guy, they, the whole crew came back to my club. Uh, yeah, we were very, very close. His family, I know Sammy's wife before Sammy met her. So, uh, yeah, we go way back, and uh, I looked up the Sammy. Absolutely, X Man. I'm, this is this is just a breakdown. Let's not get lost, everybody. Let's not get lost again on everything outside of the tapes. We're breaking down the tapes now. There's an old saying: "You're friends until you're not." <laughs> you know what I mean? Doesn't mean because you're friends once you're gonna be friends forever. Just like a marriage. That's why I got a divorce. When you, everybody get, girl gets half, guy gets half. Today everybody's equal. Goes away. Uh, but no, yeah, of course I have X man. Of course I had a lot of good things with Sammy. Sammy treated me very well, very well early on. But things changed, and it, I'll be talking about a lot of things with Sam coming up. My opinion, my observations about how they changed. Like I just talked about John. People were saying, I don't to say nothing negative about John. I just told you, he made the second biggest mistake of his criminal career. And it cost him his life. We'll talk about the first one another time, if that's okay, RJ. That's okay, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you hit, I hope I answered that. And I, when you say, I feel like it's a flip. On my end, your end, RJ's end, Who's then flipped? Because I didn't flip flop. <laughs> so throw another yeah. question at RJ. <laughs> I have a question. The consulier is the consulier bypassed when money is kicked upstairs to the boss via the underboss? No, typically it goes three ways. Yeah. Third, third, and a third. Is that right? Third, third, and a third if you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's funny. I like that's true too. Yeah. Each person gets a third is the answer. Um, it's broken down between now I, there have been greedy bosses in the past that would take 50 and they would give 25 and 25 to the uh uh consular and the underboss would take 25. Uh uh underboss isn't necessarily supposed to have a have a crew anymore, so he's not supposed to be getting kicked up from the crew. Is that right? Either one of them not supposed to have crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't want to be wrong with the last capo on the line. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty more. Plenty no. more guys than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. All right. Let's see this one. What's the best protocol to not get caught on tape? <laughs> well, yeah, he's right. There's ways. See, John, let's let's put John back back in the in play. He was the most high-profile guy probably in the country. Not probably, he was in the country. 
uh, number one target by the government. John was out in Manhattan almost every night, four or five nights a week, except when he went home and was at the Bergen. Um, he had plenty of opportunities to go to different, not rent a hotel room, not things like that to talk. You take a walk talk. You bounce from one restaurant and then you jump in another restaurant. There's so many, you get on the train. There's so many different ways you could do that to have a walk talk and not get caught on tape. As long as you don't become a creature of habit where they plant bugs. If you're going to talk at a social club, it's bugged. <laughs> you're going to talk at the restaurant at the same table like a lot of guys I know, they're going to bug it. When you put yourself in one spot, it, you come in, you come in uh, Title III uh, suicide. <laughs> you're going to get caught on tape. So that's the best protocol is don't talk at the same spot. There you go. Um, let's see. Um, all right. Why was Sammy still allowed to earn and build businesses while in the administration? Well, that was the part that John entrusted him with. Don't forget, Sammy wasn't going to be part of the administration. Frankie DiCicco wasn't there. Uh, so when Frankie dies, the dynamic changes. And as I alluded to earlier, was that John knew zero about the construction business, nor did he care to know zero or anything about it. He wanted to know nothing. So when Sammy was the person who had all that knowledge, John gave him at least a dual role besides being an administrator, uh, which was a mistake. Uh, nobody in the administration is supposed to. You have your own businesses, you have your own things going on, but nothing, as that word again, create and um, and handle this hands-on. Because in, the, in that business, when you're dealing with contractors directly and you're dealing with a lot of captains, other families or soldiers, uh, union guys, you're really successful to get pinched. You, you open yourself wide to so many people. Administrative people are supposed to be in the shadows. Talk to very few people. Have buffers. Remember Jackie knows? You're Tommy Bilotti, right? <laughs> I love that. Jackie. Uh, <laughs> he, he got comfortable because he really entrusted Bravano. And that's why it was a huge mistake. You're Tommy Bilotti. You're Tommy Bilotti. <laughs> Tommy Bilotti's dead. <laughs> I love that. Um, question. When the tapes became public knowledge, what was the reaction within the Gambino family and from other families? Good question. Yeah, an embarrassment. Embarrassment for John, for sure. Uh, saying, how could this guy be so stupid to talk in that apartment like that with the FBI's outside every day? That whole building, you got to think, is is electrified. You know, you got to figure there's bugs all over the, that whole building. I think they bugged the hallway, too, at one time. Uh, they bugged everything, just about. So uh, why he chose that apartment, who pushed him into choosing that apartment to talk, I don't know. But it was an embarrassment. Next question. <clears throat> Does the boss have to go to the commission to have an underboss whacked or not? No. Um, Mikey, what happened to Tato Arello after Sammy cooperated? How did it sit with him knowing he was his mentor? And how did he die in the end? I didn't understand your answer a couple of days ago. Yeah, it, he, Tano had a very bad heart. He was up in age. He died old age. He, he, he died, let's say, tongue-in-cheek in his bed. He had a great life, Tano. Good guy. I, I know Tano when he first started to walk. I know Tano. Uh, never really talked to Tano about it after Sammy cooperated. No need to go there and talk to him about it. Uh, it wasn't my place. But I'm sure he was uh, brokenhearted and devastating 
devastated by Sammy's cooperation. Is a, a guy he, uh, I, I really believe he loved Sammy at one time. So when Sammy says that, I'll agree with Sammy on that point, that Tano really liked or loved Sammy at one point. Um, did you ever hear of Joe Pistone or Don or slash Donnie Brasco while you were in the streets? Nope. In the life. Never. Um, let's see. We'll take a few more questions here, but then I'm gonna be wrapping up here. Um, let's see here. Should be a good one. Um What was said about the mafia cops and the murder of the Gambino member Eddie Lino? Uh, it was it was it was shocking. First of all, when it came out that they uh, they were doing actual hits, you know, it was pretty shocking. Uh, you know, pretty despicable. Uh, well, I guess we were all despicable in, in the mob too, but in the perspective of uh, everyday life, if you could have uh, cops bringing people to their debt. Don't forget, they brought Heidel to get tortured. Right? They went out looking for him like it was like they're really going to bring bring him to the police station. Uh, they, they they probably gave the address to Bobby Boreal, uh to Lastarini to kill uh, Boriello. So, yeah, it was pretty despicable you have somebody in law enforcement to, uh, to, to do all of that, to be involved in murders directly. Um, let's see here. What year did you go on record with the Gambino family? When I was born. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> it's a good answer. I got a question from your son. Oh, go back. This is not to be facetious. Yeah. Uh, you, you're, you're on a record through bloodline lineage. You know, even if you want to become a doctor, nobody's going to bother you because you have grandparents and other family members there. But officially in the street, uh, probably 17, I was brought in and officially put on record, eight, seven, eight, 17. I mean, 16, I was Shylocking already and, and taking a little sports here and there and had social clubs and being involved in all that stuff. But uh, I think it was probably 17, if I recall, that I was officially put on record. Um... Let's see here. Uh, $5 channel donation. And the question, thank you, Alexander Wilson. And the question is, Michael, should outer mobsters with failing health, like Vic Arena, get a compassionate release? Thousand percent. I don't think anybody, child molesters could stay in jail. But I don't think anybody after the age of 80 should be in prison. That's just my opinion. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, there's circumstances, child molest, there's people that are mentally ill. You got, you got, you got to be really careful. And if they're prone to that kind of violence to hit in, hurt innocent people, you got to be careful. But anybody, uh, Vic, he, they should have let him out a long time ago. This guy's bothering nobody. He just wants to go and be a grandfather. Vic was a good guy. I know him very little in the street, but uh, I was at some meetings uh, when, when the war was going on with the uh, on our side when we were supporting the the other faction. Our family was supporting the other faction too. John got it. Um, I like Vic. He was a real gentleman. Um, let's see. Michael, did you ever have any action with the Youngstown crew? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, I would have liked to have known Trevor Kent. He seemed like a real character, stand-up guy. This is a really great question. I was going to ask you this one. What the hell happened to your arm, Michael? Over here? Yeah. <laughs> That's what happens when you want to do manual labor. Yeah. <laughs> At 60, almost 68 years old. No manual labor. Don't be lifting things up. <laughs> That's it. It only hurt for a little while. 
Physical <laughs> pain just it hurts for a little while. Who made Jackie the nose? Lilo. Yep. Mr. Lilo. Gar Garofalo. This one's from your son. Uh oh. Was Sammy the Bull quick and throw his hands? Absolutely. <laughs> Sammy was a brawler. Got a wedding story to tell. But I'll tell it another day. Um, tell me about the wedding stories. Nice comment from Nick Diamond. RJ, I hope you're proud, man. No doubt in my mind, your spirit, you're a spiritual <laughs> gangster like me and many others. You're in alignment mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. The numbers don't lie. Well, thank you. No one's ever called me a spiritual gangster. I'm not a gangster, though. I never have been. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I think he means in the genre and um, okay. uh, what you project and what, you, what you're putting forward. That's what I think uh, Nick Diamond means. Yeah. Diamond, did I say that right? <laughs> you know, I grew up around a lot of street people. And a lot of my, you know, I grew up in deep poverty. And I always, what I have found in my life is that the people that high society, when high society is looking down on low society, or let's just call it low society for lack of better words, I find that typically the wrong. Um, a lot of people that I was around growing up, I there was prostitutes that I loved in the neighborhood that were very helpful in the neighborhood. There were drug dealers in the neighborhood that were very, that so, sometimes what the, what society would call bad people were the saving grace of most of, um, were the saving grace for a lot of people. So I have a different opinion on, I think you can look at pretty much anything and find something good in it. Um, and you can look at something good and some, and you can also find some bad in it. So I think humans are very complex. I think people are complex. I don't think anything is as simple as what meets the eye. So I've always studied stuff like this because I think there's more to it than what meets the eye. So there you go. There's my answer. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, is... John talking subversive in these tapes about Sammy. Same thing he killed DB for. Oh, yeah. It's, it's obvious. Yeah. John is a little... You can use even a better word than subversive. John is taking his ass to task uh, with uh, Frankie Law. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but don't forget, John is the boss. He could kill whoever he wants. He could promote whoever he wants. So he, he has the right to talk. He just got caught on tape. You think people don't talk, talk subversive in that life about each other? It's just when you get to court and you get talking about the boss. All right, we'll take three more questions here and we'll close it out. Um, Okay. What was the Gambino's biggest racket in your day, Michael? Oh, I don't think there's one single. Uh, yeah, the garbage industry uh, construction was huge. Garbage. Um, Garmin Center. I mean, it, the, the waterfront at different times, but they weren't as big as the construction after a while. Um, yeah, there were so many big industries. There were constants because they were always there. So uh, the money kept flowing. Uh, after Sammy flipped, uh, a lot of those dynamics changed because he exposed a lot and it hindered a lot of that huge money coming in. It wasn't what it was. Uh, but I, I would say that the, then Giuliani crushed the private sanitation business, um, fish market, Javits Center, and there was a lot of stuff. There was a lot of money being generated. Javits Center wasn't ours, though. Uh, but back to the Gambino family, it was the industries I just mentioned, the constants that's always been there. Um. 
who was your favorite person to sit with for business affairs outside of the New York uh, families? Well, I really didn't do too much outside, outside of California, I believe. Um, so, but I took Jackie out, but does that count? I took Jackie out there with me. We went to go see the boss of, uh, in California, Pete Milano at the time. Right, we had some fun with Pete. Got a nice California stories coming up with Pete. Some I can't find the question, but I remember it. I was getting ready to ask it. Someone said, uh, what is the number one thing that you miss about the life? Everything. When you're in it, when you're in it, arms and legs, when you live it to what you think is your fullest, there's nothing not to like about it, even the treachery. You just got to learn how to navigate treacherous people. Uh, which is an art in itself. You know, there's there's a lot of people who don't get caught up in the politics, who have some great runs. They stay under the radar. They, they, they make their money. They do their thing. There's no uh, power grab in their mind. I want to be captain. I want to be in administration. I want to be the boss. There's a lot of people who don't want that. And they coast through this whole life. And they have a great life. It's It's... A lot of people don't go to jail. Not everybody goes to jail. The expectation is you may go to jail or get killed. Absolutely not. But it depends how much you immerse yourself in that life or, or people put you in the position to say, hey, we need you here. And now you're involved in different levels of that life. There are different levels of their life. There's a lot of broke guys in that life. It's miserable when you're broke. It's miserable. You have to earn in that life. So uh, it, 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 can be, it can be daunting at times that, that you know, you, your family thinks you're, you're this big mob, mob guy. And, and you could be. You could, you could be a guy that did a lot of work, but be dead broke. You could be a degenerate gambler or never have the opportunity, which led to a lot of disruptions in families over the years, over the decades. That certainly the Gallo War, you know, like, uh, with Fachi and all that, uh, the money went one way. You know, the guys were disgruntled. So, yeah. Uh, but I, for me, my personal thing, I miss every aspect of it, even the bad parts. You got to take good with the bad. You know, you just said something that I think is the biggest myth that I find, even among creators. I hear creators, I've gotten arguments with creators about this. That it's like this belief. And everybody has so much money in the mob. Like, yeah. you know, you got, say you got 250 people in the family. My research tells me it's like any other big corporation in life. The people at the very, very top have a, a lot. Uh, people in the middle are usually like the, maybe like the middle management in a company, the middle class, and a lot of the rest of everybody else is struggling to make ends meet. Um, I see it like I look at a, a company or anything else. It's not everybody in the mob is rich, uh, but can you just dispel that rumor? <laughs> well, uh, let me give you an example. And I'll give you somebody that I knew since I was born. I idolized. I looked up to. He was my mentor. Guy I loved. Uh, Paul Zach. Paul Zacharia. Paul, he made a lot of money this time. Paul was, used to drive Carl Gambino around before Jimmy Brown drove around. Paul's a big gambler. Paul ruined himself. He should have been the captain of that crew like that when Leo died. And the only reason why, and I, I'll tell that, I don't want to keep saying this, but I'll tell that story later on. Uh, Paul destroyed money. He destroyed people in his family with money. He owed millions and millions of dollars out when he died to wise guys and legit people that he borrowed money from. Paul ruined his life. He was broke. So there are a lot of guys that that story does happen to. A lot of guys that were gamblers wind up usually broke for the most part. And if I can follow up one more time on that, because I think that's an important thing to touch on, because this is, this is widely discussed. A guy that's been in the life his whole life, and he's not... 50, 60 anymore. He's not. What's it like when you're 85 
Mm. Years old. You're not being sent out anymore. You're not running a crew probably much anymore. You don't have the ability to, maybe you're having health issues. Maybe you're, you know, how does a guy who spent his whole life in the life live well, when he's there's no, there's no pension plan. You had to put that money away through your whole tenure in, the, in your life. You had to be smart enough to, let's say, buy property, own a couple of buildings, own some homes that you rent out and collect an income, invest stock market and stuff. You had to be savvy with your money. If you're going to wait and wait for the next day and the next day to earn, you're going to go be broke sooner or later. You're going to have a terrible old age. And I know a lot of people have died broke, and it's a miserable way to live. Um, plenty of stories out there, you know, that uh, people didn't have the opportunity when they got out. You, you, it's a young man's, let's say it's a young man's sport. Right? You have to make your money and be settled and solid and solvent for when you get old. Because that money, that street money, this isn't going to last forever. And nobody's going to take care of it. My grandfather died that dead broke. Dead broke. He was getting seventy five dollars a week, and then, the, uh, you know, seventy five dollars a week. The guy was rich. He had two cars in in the twenties. He had a garage with a uh, a guy who kept the kept his cars clean all the time. Would drive him over. He, he was given he, he was given out uh, two thousand a, a month to Jerry uh, to uh, Douglas' family after after he got killed out of his pocket from the money he was collecting. Guy, was, my grandfather was rich at one point. He went broke. And, and don't forget, Michael's grandfather goes back. He's the essence of Cosa Nostra. Goes back to new Don Vito Cassio Ferro, new uh, Salvatore Dagwala, new he was an original. He was the head of the oldest crew in the country. This guy was the the purity of what that life means. And he, you know, he had nothing at the end. Okay. I think you said you was to take groceries to him, didn't you? Well, we lived next door, you know, and yeah. uh, he was a very proud guy. He, he, you know, he liked to smoke cigars, he smoked cigars his whole life. And it came down to him smoking white owls, like a 50 cent cigar at the end, you know, but he had his cigar in his mouth. Yeah. And so you see him come, he had a club on Bath Avenue. Uh, and uh, it was where Spiro had his club down, a couple of doors down. Uh, he had his club there. And you could just see him with that. That white owl in his mouth, like you look like a train coming out with this smoke coming up. Uh, but he wasn't happy in the end. He died broke. No help. Good show, Michael. We got we went a little longer. This is supposed to be 20 minutes. I tried to get to it's almost 400 people in the live chat. We didn't even plan this live. I didn't put up a hey, we're going live today. Um Actually, let me see. There's a guy up here. John O. Master left a comment and said, I thought you guys were going live on Tuesday at 4. We are going live tomorrow at 4 o'clock, John. <laughs> this was a uh, just complete spare of the moment. So, guys, sorry I can't get to everybody's questions. The chat's going crazy. There's a lot of people here, almost 400 people. Um, I didn't think we were going to get all these people to come in because it wasn't a pre-planned live. Um Damn, Michael, these people really love you, man. <laughs> you get a lot of support on YouTube. You really do. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I really, really appreciate that. And it's it's more of a testament, I think, that we tell the truth here. We give our opinions. And we want that feedback from everybody. We want to be challenged on it. And uh, I, I'm going to give you the unvarnished truth as I know it. My life's not a book. I have no reason to lie or bullshit. I'm not trying to make myself look good. That's why I said in the past, I have a hard time talking about Michael's stories. I'm talking to the third person. Somebody's going to say, yeah, you talk to the third person. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's the information I think that people respect. And that's why they're here. You know, there's some new stuff that people want to hear. I'm going to give it to you. There are these the little nuances. I'm not going to give you dead bodies that were where they were buried. I, I didn't kill... I didn't go around killing everybody, chopping people up. That's not me. That's not what I was about. Uh, I had a different philosophy in that life, whether uh, that makes me more important or less important. That's up to whoever wants to hear me. Uh, but uh, I was 
more to preserve life than take life. I never asked for anybody's life. I could have when I was in position. <laughs> so, again, it's, it's, I'm not trying to make myself look like a good guy. It's just that the facts are there about my life. So, Michael that, was the only. Michael was the only made guy in the history of the mob that you could have a fist fight with him. He's not going to, you can put your hands on him. He's not going to call for your life. <laughs> as long as you didn't know who I was. <laughs> if you did it though, and then the, the, the suicide. <laughs> if you're a made guy, you're committing suicide. But uh, yeah, football games, softball games, the guys didn't know me. You get out of a car, wrestling on the floor, whatever it was, in a bar. <laughs> I, th I liked it. It was, it was like a sport at one time. I was in pretty good shape, and I could hit. So I didn't mind rolling around a little bit. The Irish guys would like me. We used to go to the Irish bars years ago when we had nothing to do, and they we start swinging it out with them because we hit on their girls. He said, "I took many beatings. You're not a man until you take a beating. <laughs> Put you back in check. Give you reality." <laughs> You're not a man until you take a beating. <laughs> um, guys, um, thank you guys for, I mean, everyone says I'm too thankful all the time, but truly grateful for the overwhelming support that comes into this channel. We've exceeded our goals on Patreon already. I'm kind of surprised at how fast Patreon has picked up. Um, uh if you haven't joined Patreon, join Patreon. Um, and it's some really great content up there. We only assessed about 40 minutes of the, uh, the Ravenite tapes. And it's four hours long. Those 40 minutes of tapes is four hours long. Um, so you're really going to get an insightful, a very insightful perspective on these transcripts. Um, it's it's been I mean I've read every book you could read I've been studying the mob my whole life I never saw I, I mean this is it it's astounding to me so um, please support our Patreon thank you for being here on the live tonight uh, we we appreciate the support you guys show our channel um, so that's all I got close it out Michael thank you see everybody tomorrow if you can on Patreon for our live yeah we'll be live. We'll be live at four o'clock discussing uh, part three and part four of the Ravenite tapes. Um, it's a live invite. Anybody who's there, you're welcome on. It's a smaller, more intimate audience. That's the best thing that you, that comes with Patreon. You know, people say, "Why are you charging? You're draining everyone for my." If we were trying to make money, I'd put the shows on YouTube. But it's not about money. It probably would make more on YouTube. Okay, so it's you're getting. You don't have to deal with trolls. There's no one going to attack you for your opinion on Patreon. It's a more, um, the audience is more uh, a serious audience. People who are there because they want to have an intelligent conversation, intelligent discussion. Um, it's more intimate. We're all talking together. Every question gets answered. Every, you know, you can come right on the screen, communicate with, uh, with Michael. So come on the Patreon. You're going to get um, information that is, 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 is mind blowing. Even me, I'm the benefit. Like I get, I'm the only one that gets a free membership because <laughs> I'm part of this show. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Go ahead, Michael. Say bye. Close it out. Stay well. Merry Christmas to everybody. If we don't see you before, hopefully we will. Merry Christmas to you and your families. Be well. Thank you, guys. <laughs>